You're good. Go for it. Great. Thanks, everybody, for joining us. Sorry about the previous technical issues. Diversity is a noun, and it's the state of being diverse. It's variety. It's a range of different things. I'm going to summarize a few excerpts from a paper that was published in Scientific American by Dr. Kenneth Gibbs, who's a cancer prevention fellow at the National Cancer Institute. And I'll drop the link to the publication in the chat if you're interested. Read over it. Diversity is defined previously is difference. As such, diversity is a property of groups and not individuals. So me as a white female, I am not diverse as an individual because an individual cannot be diverse. Groups of individuals, such as the scientific research workforce, can possess diversity. For some dimensions of social, social difference like nationality, the scientific enterprise has a considerable degree of diversity. We have people from every nation involved in the scientific research process. In other ways, the scientific enterprise lacks diversity, especially as it relates to the participation of women, certain minority groups, and people with disabilities. Diversity in science refers to cultivating talent and promoting the full inclusion of excellence across the whole social spectrum. And this includes people from backgrounds that are traditionally underrepresented and traditionally well represented. So we need everybody together because Diversity, all it means is variety. We need everybody. There's three really good points in this paper that Dr. Gibbs makes. Number one is that diversity is crucial to excellence. He notes that when you're trying to solve complex problems, which is exactly what we do as scientists and engineers, progress often results from diverse perspectives. So you'll note that when you're working on a team to solve a problem, you might have really, um, interesting perspectives from other people that grew up in a completely different place or mindset or social setting than you did. And that is how we come to solutions and conclusions. The second point is lack of diversity represents a loss of talent. And we have seen this firsthand in the women's network. If you exclude a significant part of your population, i.e. reduce diversity, you're basically eliminating a huge component of the um, talent that you could potentially have, and you could, you could be completely missing out on discoveries and new inventions. And the third point is enhancing diversity is key to long-term economic growth and global competitiveness. This is a really big deal, especially in countries that uh, omit or reject minorities uh, from education. So what are half of all children in the US born? They're born female. Half of babies in the US are born female. A continued lack of diversity in STEM fields is detrimental to our ability to build the next generation of scientists in this nation and in, in all nations because we are not accessing the deep end of the talent pool. Half of our population is almost systematically omitted. By 2023, only 45% of the US school population will be white and half of that will be female. So we're only, if we're very like, white male oriented in the United States specifically, or just male oriented in general in other countries, you're gonna miss a huge component of the population. So the bottom line is that diversity leads to better problem solving, expands the talent pool, and it's important for long-term economic growth. And these are all things that we're gonna need in the market today. So today our, our speakers and panelists all have a dual passion, a combined geoscience and diversity driven goal set. And we're gonna start our session with Lorena and she is gonna speak with Clara and they're gonna to talk to you about the Latin American women's role and future in the energy industry. So what makes Lorena passionate about geoscience? Geology deals with the history of our planet but also with our ability as humans to find the resources that fuel our civilization. And both of these things are fascinating. A fun fact about Lorena is once she rode her bike from Houston to Austin as part of the MS-150 and it was a two day bike ride and lots of pain but lots of fun, she said. So I'm gonna hand it over to Lorena and Clara. Thank you. Hola. Hey, Padre. How are you? Hello, everybody. So do you want me to play the, the presentation again? I mean, yeah. I don't know. Wait, wait, wait. The first, the first thing that I, I want to say is I want to tip my hat to whoever put this Zoom session 
together in like five seconds, you know, so that's great. No, and no then... problem. Uh, that was me, Meredith. I, I couldn't freaking deal with the level of incompetency that was occurring on the other platform. So if we get in trouble, I'm just going to be like, you weren't there and you didn't know how painful it was. And I'm recording it. Here's the recording. That's the plan. So uh, everybody should have the ability to share. If you have difficulties, let me know and I'll do what I can on my um, honestly kind of crappy Wi-Fi. No, oh, thank you, Meredith. And then the second question, Clara, I, I guess, because we play this uh, video that we had with the presentation, but I don't know how many people were able to see it. And I, I mean, I don't want to, I mean, I don't know. Let's see, the chat is open. Who wants to see it again? Because maybe we can have a conversation. Um, or I don't know if you were able to, to hear the audio. And I know there are other members of that uh, presentation here. And Maria Antonieta Laurent is here and, and some other people. And I don't know if you want to make this more dynamic and ask questions, or do you want to see it again? I think see it again because nobody except for a few of the moderators saw or heard anything the first time. So most people didn't see it. Okay, then Clara, you're the boss. Okay, not the boss, but I can share this, the slides. I, I was crying, so I, I have to cry again. <laughs> listening to these women presenting. Okay, let me, um, you, you can see the, the slides, yeah? Hola, I oh. Yes, you can see them. I'm going to play them. Yes. Just, com just confirm yep. also if you can um, listen to the, because I have like a speaker here. Okay, let's do that. Hola, I am Clara Rod. No, now oh. it's mute. Sorry. Thank you very much for connecting today. It is an honor to be here presenting as part of a team of amazing Latin women. We represent 500 GeoLatinas members located in 34 countries. And what is GeoLatina? We are an inclusive community and grassroots organization with a mission to embrace and power and inspire Latinas to pursue and thrive in earth and planetary science. Even though some of us haven't even met in person, went to different universities and are at different levels of our careers, there are challenges and achievements that connect us. We all had to leave our country of origin to be safe and find opportunities. And we have all succeeded in a male-dominated environment. Or that is what I believe. I am one of the three co-founders of Geolatina. When we started Geolatina, we dreamed with something unique, an innovative circular organization. We created six vehicles for change. The core of Geolatina, what keeps the organization active, moving, is the Geolatina Leadership Council. All the Geolatina members can be leaders. They have the opportunity to create and lead projects or initiatives in the different committees of the Leadership Council. One of the ways to make sure we make change is adapting our mission and initiatives to local needs or issues. There is a group of ambassadors. They're all Latin women located in different countries around the world. There are also local teams or chapters in different universities and cities. The other three groups are the advisors, the liaisons, and the board of directors. The advisors are women from academia and industry who inspire us and advise on different topics. The liaisons are other groups or societies we collaborate with. And the directors, a group we need to become a nonprofit organization. In three years, we have accomplished a lot. We have presented in many conferences. We have won team awards, grants. We have a blog, podcasts of your Latinas sharing opportunities. We do mentoring. There is a writing community, an initiative to learn and practice languages, a coding group where your Latinas learn 
and achieve together. We also do kind and constructive dry runs and peer reviews for our members. We are everywhere on social media. We have featured over 120 Latin women by embracing them and their research or work. We also support the well-being of our members and much more. Now you know who and what your Latinas do and are. Our network of volunteer students and scientists is aligned with the sustainable development goals of the United Nations. The engineers and scientists of our network, through their daily life and professional activities, collaborate with their grain of sand to achieve those goals within their communities, their universities, workplaces, and countries. Our engineers and geoscientists help in goals related with building resilient infrastructure and promote inclusive industrialization while fostering innovation. Make cities more inclusive, safe, and sustainable, and promote sustainable consumption and production patterns. Our geoscientists and bioscientists mainly help in goals related with the access to safe water, to progress in the transition to affordable and sustainable energy, and to help conserve the world ocean, seas, and marine resources. And last, but not least, all together, <clears throat> we do our best to help end poverty in all its forms and everywhere we are, achieve gender equality, and empower women and girls to reduce inequalities within and among our communities, our regions, and even among countries. And through our work and research, we participate in action to tackle climate change and its impact. Hi, my name is Maria Antonieta Lorente. I am a geological engineer with a master's degree and a PhD earned with honors. During the 50 years since I started thinking that I would like to be a professional, I have faced many challenges, most of them related with achieving. When I was finishing my secondary school, I started considering in which career path I would like to dedicate my life. I chose to geology because I love the earth science that they teach us at the secondary school. And law because I had a deep trust in justice. Both quite different career paths. I was in the verge of giving up to geology when I found out that at the university in Caracas, it was at the engineering faculty. And I thought it was very difficult with tons of math and mechanics. And also, it was a male career. A male word. But in a casual conversation with another girl, she told me, hey, I am studying engineering. And when I asked her why she was doing that, she answered something like, why not? So if she can, I can. And that is where all this started. The first challenge was to achieve technical recognition in a male career 
or male-dominated career. Also, when I started work, I realized the need to regain knowledge and experience in my area of knowledge, that was biostratigraphy, paleontology, the use of fossils to better understand their fossil record. That was lost previous, in the previous years to the Venezuelan oil nationalization in the 1970s. Once in my career, I find out that it was something very needed to open a path for the technical career into executive level. At those times, it doesn't matter how good you were in your expertise, you will never reach the status or the salaries that an executive has. And of course, once you are sometime into your career, you realize how important it is to teach, lead, and motivate future generations. I must say, I'm still working on that. Okay, then, how to break the glass ceilings that are preventing you from achieving your goals, for get all those challenges with success? First, my recommendation is work hard. Work very hard to achieve your goals and work hard to be always the best. You can reach incredible things when you work hard. You can have academic achievements and get to the maximum of that. You can have professional achievement and get to the maximum of that. And you can get all sorts of different professional achievements in your local professional societies or in the international societies or helping here Latina. You can also need to be always a good player, a good team player. Doesn't matter if you are in the in field work or you are doing office work, always be a good team player. We be fair to your teammates. Support all of them. Motivate your team. Do the best you can do for the team. And last but not least, never give up to your dreams because it's never too late to reach for them. Hello, everyone, everybody. Um, I'm Lorena Moscardelli, and I'm a geoscientist. In terms of uh, career challenges, uh, since 2000, when I got my bachelor's degree in geological engineering in Central University of Venezuela in Caracas, I can talk about a series of things that included uh, the meltdown of the Venezuelan oil and gas industry in the early 2000s when I was working as a young geoscientist for uh, the National Oil Company in there, navigating the challenges of academia and immigration in the U.S. Uh, in a highly competitive environment. So that can be uh, both uh, challenging and very stressful. Um, battling promotion blockage and salary inequalities in a male-dominated environment. Um, you know, I don't have particular examples, but it has happened uh, a few times. Uh, transitioning from industry uh, to academia, then back to industry, and now back to academia. Um, and the reasons behind all these uh, transitions being a variety of things, uh, from political unrest in my home country, uh, changing technical or professional interests, more on my own side, because I was uh, bored or fed up in certain positions uh, at certain times. Um, of course, uh, industry turmoils, uh, you know, like the one that we are experiencing at the moment uh, with the energy transition and, and, and so on rhetoric. Pandemics, uh, challenging times that we, that we have been uh, experiencing. Family challenges, you know, life happens and sometimes you have to make uh, decisions that uh, are not that easy to make. And, you know, I was thinking about uh, doing a list or a timeline of accomplishments, uh, but given that we are going through these uh, very difficult times, you know, in, in the pandemic, I'm going to keep it simple and, and just say that in terms of accomplishments, I'm very grateful uh, and I feel very accomplished to be uh, alive and well. 
but I think it's, it's more important for me uh, right now to share some learnings and, and maybe provide some advice uh, if, if that can be um, useful, you know, especially for early career individuals. So I would say that through all the challenges uh, and, and all my accomplishments, these, these things here have really helped me. Um, uh, first, try to surround yourself with, with good people who cares about you and can mentor you, sponsor you, and pick you up when, when you're down, you know. Um, the, the other thing is uh, go places. Uh, never stop walking. Don't be afraid of falling because it's inevitable. Enjoy every second. Uh, of, of, of what you're doing and where you are. Have no regrets, uh, but try to learn from everything uh, you see and everyone you meet. Uh, be the best that you can be uh, every day. Then know that you can wear many hats and that feeling uncomfortable means that you are learning something, that you are stronger, smarter, and hopefully kinder than uh, what you thought. Wear your, wear your wrinkles with, with pride. Um, so these have been things that have helped me uh, greatly uh, over the last, you know, 20 years and, and something that I think and I hope uh, can be helpful for others. Thank you. Hola, I am Clara Rodriguez. My interest in geoscience started as a child inspired by my mother, who is a soil scientist, and used to take me to her lab in Venezuela. She is my role model. I was 15 when I left my hometown to study geophysical engineering at a university in Caracas. I found the opportunity to be an exchange student in Oklahoma when I was 19. And although I could not see my family for one year, it was a great opportunity to practice and improve my English. When I started working, I was 21, and I have faced a variety of challenges in 19 years. After working for four years and getting married, I left my home country to do a master in petroleum geoscience at Imperial College London in the UK. We started in the UK working, and this is when I decided to become a mom. And later, I decided to pursue a PhD. I was a mom of two when I started my PhD and had my third baby the last year of my PhD. Despite the challenges of trying to balance my personal and professional life, I graduated with honors. A slumberjack gave me an opportunity in the United States. After my PhD is when I faced more discrimination as a woman in the energy industry. During this difficult time is when I decided to create Geo Latina, first as a Twitter account to support and give visibility to Latin women. A new opportunity arrived to be a technical leader at Petronas Mexico, a position I started with the pandemic and with that a variety of challenges. I love my job and Petronas highly values my experience and my PhD research. Right now I juggle work, family and volunteering with Yo Latino and the APE Salt Basins Technical Interest Group. I am still learning every day, every hour. Since I'm a mother of three girls, that gives me the inspiration to care a lot about women in general, not just Latinas. There are so many things that have helped me, and today I can share with you some advice. I hope you find something valuable. I get into a little trouble because I'm real. I think being authentic, and always giving your opinion is important. I'm also very confident about what I have learned, my strength, my knowledge. Please be confident about your abilities to lead, create, innovate, and make change. I'm also very visible on social media. 
If you're comfortable with that, I recommend professional visibility because it can open so many opportunities. Collaboration is important. Just be careful with finding the real allies who are taking actions for change. Because we are in privileged positions, it is important that we also spend some time helping those in need, inspiring and supporting the underprivileged and younger generations. That can be so much more rewarding than any award or recognition, a smile and appreciation that you will remember for the rest of your life. Thank you. Hi, I am Maria Cecilia Bravo, and I am a petroleum engineer. We all had different but similar challenges, just at different times and in different places. I graduated from Simon Bolivar University as a chemical engineer in 2003 in Venezuela. Then I moved to England with the intention to work as an engineer, but things don't always happen as we expect. I felt discrimination and racism for the first time, not only for being a foreigner, but also due to the cultural differences that made me doubt my own personal values sometimes. But soon I figured out that I was just underqualified and in the wrong market. I knew that I wanted to stay being an engineer, and I was determined to not let anything stop me. So what I needed to do was to get a better preparation. So I worked as a supermarket assistant, as a butcher, as a fishmonger. I was doing telesales. I was selling foreign currency. I even delivered Chinese food at night. And after five years, I did manage to save enough money to pay for my own master's degree fees and home expenses for one year. So this is what the program will last. So I went to Harry Watt University in Edinburgh, where I achieved a master's degree in petroleum engineering. I started to work in Strombacher as a field engineer offshore for drilling operations. Of course, this is a very much male-dominated environment and very challenging. But I still demonstrated that I could achieve technical recognition. Was it easy? No. But I keep pushing to succeed. I think the biggest challenge that we have right now is to teach and motivate ourselves and to the up-and-coming generation to not give up and at the same time, to steer that motivation towards something that brings real value to society. For me, it has been to become an active contributor to technical society. And by giving this testimony here, I hope to show that we all can make a difference by looking at the challenges as opportunities. The challenges are opportunities to learn about yourself. Opportunity to develop your willpower. Opportunity to learn, to keep focused, to show adaptability, and to discover how strong we all are. We need to start believing in our own internal force. Being part of your Latinas as an organization has allowed me to get confident to see these challenges we knew us. And as Edmund Hillary said about reaching the Everest peak for the first time, it is not the mountain that we conquer, but ourselves. After all, the challenges are what shape us into the person that we are now. Me, I am a hardworking professional and a very strong woman able to adapt and succeed at everything with passion and determination. Thank you. Hello, my name is Marja Svet Buscatej. I'm here today to tell you my story, my challenges, opportunities, and learnings. I have developed my career as a geoscientist throughout the years. It started when I graduated as a geological engineer. Soon after, I was recruited by Schlumberger to work offshore as a seismic on board processor. 
this was my first big opportunity to work internationally, but it also was a very challenging time. I left home very young to work offshore. Hardships, stressful travel, and I was the only female in a crew of 50 people. We all lived for six weeks in that boat that you see on the photo. It was a challenging time for me because I have to look after myself in a different way. I have to learn to live in a low profile, uh, in a male-dominated environment, where I had to try to avoid as much as possible any sort of attention, any sort of uh, special treatment, uh, and any sort of special recognition, just because I was a female. Very soon after, I realized that life, of course, wasn't for me. I took a sabbatical uh, from work, and I took a master's in integrated petroleum design. This time was a very important time in my life of decision making for my career to draw the path of what I wanted to do and being independent. I could save all the money I needed to finance my international studies by working offshore and I could support myself for that year, which was a great achievement. From the following years where my career blown, bloom. I worked uh, internationally in many places in the world, had amazing experiences, amazing opportunities to learn from many, many great uh, people in the industry, including Clara, who is presenting here as well. I presented uh, many uh, presentations at conferences, I published papers. I had a great time learning and growing my career. In 2016, I was delayed hit by the 2014 crisis, I became an industry survivor. Schlumberger put me on a sabbatical year, on which I was not allowed to work in any oil and gas industry-related activities. So my career was put on a standby. It was, was a very, very difficult and challenging time in my career. Since all those years that I have worked so hard to grow and to be where I was, came to a complete stop. Uh, that was really hard for me to see. I was a very career-focused person, uh, and I had to shift completely that view to focus on my personal life. Um, it turns out, with that big challenge, it came a great and amazing and the best reward. I went backpacking and got married to my husband that year. We traveled for about um, 10, 12, 12, 10, 11 months. Um, we traveled 16 to 17 countries in Asia and in Central America. Uh, I took a yoga teacher training and it turned out that year was the best year of my life. We had amazing opportunities, we had amazing learning amazing experiences um, that are just once in a lifetime. In 2017, I started working again, and I also started my family that year. My baby boy was born, um, and I started to live a different type of life. Now, my life wasn't just focused on my career. Now, my life is being split into my career and a family. So, I am... Um, learning uh, how difficult it is for a woman to pursue a career and a family uh, in the industry. Luckily, I joined Geo Latinas and I had great support from the group. I have met amazing women that have it all. They have amazing careers, they have amazing families, and everything is possible. Um, and I am very grateful <clears throat> for uh, the opportunity. For the future, your Latinas will continue to be aligned with the sustaining and developing goals of the United Nations by making a positive impact on our common goals as engineers and geoscientists and working from within our community to also support and inspire future generations to engage and maintain these goals endlessly. As geoscientists and engineers, in the oil and gas industry, our role is key to ensuring sustainable development. And as we learn how to relate to these goals, 
We appreciate and welcome collaboration with groups like the AAPG Women Network, Association for Women Geoscientists, Black in Geoscience Community, Equality, Diversity and Inclusion in Geoscience Initiative, and others, working all together for a sustainable future. Thank you very much. Okay, that was it. Thank you for listening. Thank you for presenting. That was fantastic. I'm glad that we got to replay the video because I think every almost everybody missed it the first time. So it was really impactful. Okay, I'm gonna keep moving on. I'm actually gonna let Rochelle introduce our next speaker. Hi everyone. I am uh, going to read, sorry, um, Munira Raji, Dr. Munira Raji. She is um, not here right at this moment, but she's representing, she's one of the co-founders of Black in Geoscience. So I'm just going to read uh, her biography, and then I believe Meredith is going to play her um, her link from the YouTube. So Dr. Munira Raji is a geoscientist and renewable energy consultant. She is a visiting researcher at the School of the Environment, Geography, and Geosciences in the University of Portsmouth, working with the Rock Mechanics Laboratory Group to determine induced fracture and fluid flow in tight oil reservoirs, viscosity and temperature effects, permeability enhancement, and prompent in shale and tight sandstones. Dr. Munira obtained her PhD in geological sciences from Durham University, UK, with a focus on regional offshore unconventional shale oil prospect mapping in the UK sector of the North Sea. She received a BSc in geology from the University of, University of Portsmouth, an MSc in petroleum geoscience from the University of Derby in the UK, and an online diploma in sustainable energy. While in the petroleum industry, Dr. Munira worked on an unconventional shale oil and gas evolution of the wider Mule Gulf, sorry, East Midlands province in, of England. She completed organophases mapping and burial history used to build geologic models, conducted laboratory analyses, and completed play-based exploration and risk assessment methods to determine prospect locations. Dr. Munira is currently transitioning her expertise from traditional petroleum exploration into the geothermal energy and rare earth elements recovery from coal and fly ashes. She is a co-founder of the Black in Geoscience Group, a virtual community, global community for Black geoscientists, and also serves on the Exploration Geophysicist, the SEG Sustainability Committee. And with that, Meredith, are you able to play uh, the YouTube link for her recording? We're not getting sound, Meredith. Yeah, no sound. Maybe you can share the link and people can click on the link and, and then come back here. Meredith is playing because she has to unmute yourself, um, sorry, herself to, so we can listen to the video, I think. That's what I did. Or you have to make sure that the night is an important panel on achieving gender, ethnic, and racial equality in professional society uh, organization. And for inviting me to talk uh, about the Black APG women. Hello, um, welcome to uh, this uh, presentation. My name is Dr. Manuro Aji. I'm a visitor researcher in West of Portsmouth, based in the UK. I just want to say thank you for joining in to listen to my talk today tied to Black Ninja Science, a larger community for Black scientists. I'd like to expressively thank the APG Women's Network for organizing this important panel on achieving gender, ethnic, and racial equality in professional exercise uh, organization and for inviting me to talk uh, about the Black Ninja Science. Okay. 
Okay. Um, uh, Black into Science is a grassroots uh, community, uh, virtual community that inspires, connects, and empowers Black to Scientists. Uh, it was established in the summer of 2020, following in the footsteps of other Black in S group, like uh, the Black Better Week, the Black in Astro Week, and the Black in Europe. Okay. Um, our, our aim is to uh, use uh, 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 social media, particularly Twitter and uh, Instagram, to connect with other Black scientists world, uh, worldwide, build a community and a safe space that elevates and supports all Black scientists. Uh, to also promote the visibility of Black scientists within the science community and beyond, advocate for the retention of Black scientists and the workforce uh, in the Black science community, uh, and amplify our research and our work. Okay. Um, all right. So, it's like it. So, in August 2020, uh, Dr. Enrita Ali and Dr. Greg Booker and I put together a call on Twitter asking for uh, uh, people to volunteer to help organize the Black Ninja Science Week. And we received over 30 uh, uh, interest from Black scientists and allies working in different areas of the science. We came together to help us organize the first Black Ninja Science Week uh, in September of last year. Uh, so yes, just a video of uh, uh, some of the uh, Black organizers for the Black Ninja Science Week. I won't have the time to share this now, um, but you can watch that on our YouTube uh, channel if you want. So our goal, we achieve our goal for the uh, Black Ninja Science Week, which is which was to create an opportunity to network and share stories of what's like to be a Black Ninja Scientist. Uh, and uh, we use the Black Ninja Science Week to learn and understand what's required for us as Black Ninja Scientists to work towards and improve representation in our community. Okay, um, moving on. Uh, we organize a, a range of activities, ranging from talk or panel discussion, align as many people as possible to engage with the Black Indian Science community. Okay, so um, um, some of the panel discussion we organized for last year was uh, uh, a Black in the Mold, which is a, 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 a range of discussion around a uh, uh, what black scientists face in the field when they go out for field work. And um, we had a lot of people share their experience with us on, on, for, for, for the panel discussion. And then we had another uh, panel discussion around uh, the career, uh, the, the barrier uh, of black scientists face in the career and education. And then we talked about decolonizing just science. Uh, that was a very interesting panel discussion as well. And uh, we also had a uh, mini, uh, 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 a panel discussion around uh, what the uh, uh, black scientists in atmospheric science, for example, face, and uh, what the uh, black scientists in uh, biosphere face, and uh, black scientists in uh, planetary science, what all they face in, in terms of uh, the, the, the area of research. So for us, um, um, uh, so after the Black Ninja Science Week, it was important for us to be able to track uh, the coverage and the metric of success. So we, we measured that uh, uh, to, to sort of understand what worked and what didn't work for us. So we use our, our Twitter analytics uh, keyhole to track uh, the Black Ninja Science uh, Week hashtag for the week. And so this is just a, a snapshot of the impact and the reach of the Black Ninja Science Week on Twitter during the Black Indian Science uh, Week in September last year. Our Twitter account gained over uh, 8,000 followers within two weeks, uh, which is very good. And uh, it's, it's not a frequent uh, tag for the science academic uh, requests of seeking to attract students or staff from uh, Black Indian Science Group. Uh, we had uh, over 5 million Twitter reach. Uh, Twitter reach is a uh, number of unique users we saw tweet containing Black Ninja Science. Um, we also had uh, close to 7 million impression on Twitter. That's, uh, that's, 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 uh, that's huge. Uh, uh, Twitter impression is uh, the number of times users saw 
course containing Black Indigenous Science or Black Indigenous Science Week. And we, we, we think uh, the first Black Indigenous Science Week uh, was a massive success and we're very happy that, that we were able to, to do that virtually. So um, for last year, Black Indigenous Science Week, uh, we achieved this, you know, the goal that we set out to achieve last year. Uh, creating visibility for ourselves so that the world can see that Black Indian science exists everywhere. So uh, last year we talked about uh, geo-racism, uh, uh, systematic bias, challenges and barriers Black Indian scientists face every day in addition to some of the life challenges that we face uh, 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 as individuals. Uh, so this year, uh, for the Black Indian Science Week, we decide uh, we tired of talking about uh, racism or sharing traumatic experience because it's too exhausting for us to keep talking about all of this every 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 time. So we decided to focus our our our, our team for the Black Indian Science Week in two thousand and twenty one on climate crisis, natural hazards, uh, just sustainability and leadership in science because these topics are very important to our community who uh, most times face the worst impact of climate change. So for the uh, 2021 uh, Black Indian Science Week, uh, yes, just so uh, a snapshot of the organizer who helped uh, work tirelessly to help us organize the Black Indian Science Week this year. So we say thank you for that. So um, uh, we had uh, we had a very interesting uh, week where all week uh, uh, black a lot of black indigenous scientists uh, logged into Twitter to tweet about themselves uh, uh, black uh, using black indigenous science work for which is like introducing yourself and sharing your research and celebrating your uh, your accomplishments um, and then the the, uh, the following day uh, uh, Tuesday we had a, a, a expert tweet chat a discussions around climate crisis we had panel discussions we had a, a interesting uh, a panelist to discuss climate crisis uh, 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 as part of the event so on uh, on the Wednesday we had a natural resource uh, natural hazards and disaster management discussion around uh, uh, what it means to, to 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 live in the community where there's always natural hazards or disaster happening. And then on, on Thursday, we had uh, a discussion around natural resources. Uh, we had a panelist from uh, Africa who came in on, 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 on Twitter to, to discuss uh, different uh, natural resources in the country, uh, the sort of uh, uh, challenges they face and uh, how uh, the community can benefit from uh, improved uh, data collections or data, data exchange and, uh, and uh, and uh, data management. On Friday, we had uh, a, another discussion around just sustainability and in just science, which, which uh, was a discussion around having uh, uh, people who work in uh, just sustainability talk about uh, how they incorporate just sustainability into their work. Or we have panelists from the Caribbean talk about what they do in terms of responsible uh, consumption and production and uh, clean water and sanitation, affordable and clean energy. And then on Saturday, we had uh, another expert panel discussion around leadership in geoscience, what it means to be leaders in geoscience. Uh, for them, them many leaders, uh, especially uh, outside the, uh, the US, uh, like in the UK, we have, we have only one uh, uh, black professor of geology uh, who was uh, part of the uh, panel leaders leadership in the science panel to talk about what sort of uh, the sort of uh, uh, the experience the sort of challenges they face or the the way forward and some and give some uh, advice to 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 the black uh, the science community on how to to actively be involved in the community and and try to make changes to the community. So um, in a nutshell, uh, just just a, a snapshot of the impact the Black Indian Science Week made in uh, 2021 uh, uh, Black Indian Science Week, which was just a few weeks ago. Uh, we had uh, 1.2 million Twitter impressions, and uh, we made you know, 153k impression per day. Uh, this impact wasn't as as, as as massive as it was last year because last year 
uh, a lot of people were home. There was a, a national lockdown in uh, most of the country. So people were home and then we had a lot of participation. But uh, we're still very pleased that this year we made up to 1.2 million different impression uh, for the Black Indian Science Week. And uh, we had we had this uh, uh, interesting uh, 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 hashtag on uh, Black Indian Science published, which is uh, sort of enlightening the research carried out by Black Indian scientists uh, everywhere. Uh, we, we that that gained a lot of exposure as well. We made uh, over four thousand uh, four hundred thousand reach, uh, made over seven hundred thousand impression for, for that for that for that uh, for the Black Indian Science Week using uh, the Black Indian Science published. So, uh, the lot of research work done by Black Indian scientists out there. Uh, so we just wanted to highlight that to to let people know that uh, we are actually very good at research and publishing. Um, so the snapshot of the impact of the uh, the Black Indian Science Week uh, again is looking at the uh, natural resource play. That's the where the, where we had uh, panelists from uh, from uh, Africa come to talk about natural resources. We had we made a very good uh, uh, in, uh, uh, impression on Twitter for that day. Um, just to to round up this, uh, before I leave, I just want to uh, talk about our social media platform where you can find out more about us, or what we do, who we are, and um, and if you have a job or advert that you want to post on our tweet on our Twitter on our website, you can you can email us. So our email address is on, on our Twitter page, and uh, we post we, we can post your job adverts. We can we can we can share with you can share resources with the Black Science community. Uh, you can find us on www.blackindiescience.org. Oh, you can also find us on other social media platforms like uh, on Twitter, on uh, Instagram, on, uh, on, 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 on Facebook, and on YouTube, where we post our videos uh, about uh, our panel discussions or our activities. So uh, before I round up, I'd just like to say a big thank you to all our supporters over the years. Uh, this uh, uh, organizations and society have been very supportive of, 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 of the Black New Science community. They've helped us in several ways by amplifying our work, amplifying our community, and, and sharing anything we post on Twitter. So we want to say a big thank you to all of you for, for being a, 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 a good ally, for being a good partner, and for being good supporters. So uh, looking ahead, uh, so uh, for us, what we really want to do is to increase visibility and showcase the expertise of Black scientists because we are experts in our field. There are a lot of experts in Black scientists out there that you, know, you don't need to, to, to sort of look for that everywhere around you. Uh, and we want the, uh, the, the, the science community commitment to uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion to translate to something concrete for the Black and the science and uh, other marginalized scientists. Uh, because we keep hearing, oh, uh, we're trying to improve our DEI, but we want that to sort of translate to something concrete that we can measure, that we can see and experience. And um, moving forward, we want a better collaboration between the science community and the Design, uh, the Black Indian Science in form of uh, outreach program, uh, inviting us to give presentations like this one, uh, uh, inviting us to give uh, keynote uh, speeches, uh, inviting us to collaborate with you on your science research, and uh, inviting us to, to, to be on, 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 on panel, inviting us to be on the council uh, in, in society, in geological society, in, inviting us to be a part of the community because we're there and you know that we are you know, the love black designs everywhere so thank you for listening in. your house <laughs> thank you thanks for playing that Meredith that was awesome all right next up we have our third speaker, who's Lisa. She's going to talk to us today about engaging collaborations, encouraging professional cultures, and enhancing career. And she's going to talk about AWG's ongoing efforts to support diversity, equity, and inclusion in geoscience. What makes Lisa passionate about geoscience is the complexity of the stories and the scales that we can 
study to understand how earth features and landscapes form uh, tiny isotopes of minerals from tiny isotopes all the way to huge mountain ranges. Fun fact about Lisa going way back, way back in the day, her first publication was when she was 14 and it was a haiku poem about her dog digging potatoes. <laughs> it's all yours, Lisa. Sounds good, thank you very much. It's that very early connection with um, digging in the dirt and the rocks, right? Um, thank you all for putting this together and for um, sticking with uh, you know, the challenges of the technology. I have to say, I am definitely more familiar and comfortable using Zoom after the last couple of years. Um, so today I wanna to talk to you about what AWG does um, and I want to recognize all of the different people who have done this work. So I'm here just presenting to you all what individual chapters across the world have done um, as members of AWG, the board of directors that kind of helps manage AWG, the AWG foundation that funds a lot of our projects, and then all those project leaders who do all the work to support a lot of the programs that we have at AWG. Um, I am Stepping off, I just a couple weeks ago finished my position as the past president of AWG, um, and so kind of committed to working and representing, and, and the, the current presidents were all unavailable to participate and kind of keep you all up to date, but I can see I've included all of them because, like I said, this has been the work of so many, so many great people who are trying to um, improve diversity, equity, inclusion in geoscience. So let me make my slides move here. Oops. Okay, so who is AWG? Um, we started, AWG actually started um, way back. So officially the Association for Women Geoscientists began in the San Francisco Bay Area, Bay Area with a chapter, a group of women who were talking, kind of meeting and talking about pay disparities and um, kind of problems that they were having in their workplaces. Um, but really there was some beginning before that, even in 1973, the Women Geoscientists Committee was started as a kind of a group of AGI or committee as part of AGI, but that AGI committee was dissolved when AWG started to grow, gain force and become an official association. Now we have about 800 or more than 800 members worldwide. Um, it's a mix. We have probably 50% of our members are students, but we also have many, many professionals. Um, we have institutions that are members and corporations that are members too. And we have 49 chapters and the map um, here shows all of the chapters um, locations that we have in the US and around the world. And this was just updated. So it has some of our new chapters that have just been added this year. So we are growing, we're reaching out. And those chapters, I think, um, um, as we'll talk about, have really been an important part of our community in terms of what AWG does is being kind of the local um, group of people that are able to kind of create a community and a network um, to help, help, every, help women um, with their challenges that they face. So I wanna share with you our mission um, we have the three, what we call the three E's. Um, our first E is to encourage women, the participation of women, um, and all who identify as women in the geosciences. Um, our second E is exchange. So one of the goals is to exchange educational, technical, and professional information um, for women in, in geosciences. And then we want to enhance the professional growth and advancement of women in geosciences. And so the next few slides kind of go through some of the ways that we work to do this. And one thing too that I really liked as I was kind of looking through some of the past materials is that in, some, in one of the descriptions of AWG is that it evolves to change and help people with the challenges um, that they are facing at a given time. So um, kind of some of the focuses and some of the goals have evolved and changed over time because of just changing needs that, that we see and that we face. Um, and so, um, like I said, I had the three E's and what I wanna do is kind of show some specific examples of what AWG does in terms of, kind of achieving its goals. And so the idea of encouraging women to pursue geoscience um, to, or, and, and women and girls even. So a lot of what we're, the mission has been throughout time in, in AWG, throughout the almost 45 years of AWG, um, is to offer different opportunities and outreach opportunities for, in particular, for um, students, K through 12 students, and then college students, university students, graduate students, to make sure that they have the supports that they need um, to be successful and to enter into careers too. And so some of the programs that we have um, that are part of AWG 
um, and these are funded by the AWG Foundation, um, is one is GeoGirls, and that one is a project um, out in, a, and I'm gonna forget the location, but they're looking at, it's a group that takes out, takes out um, K through 12 girls and or actually probably K through eight and, and has them do hands-on activities related to volcanoes. Um, another big one that has a big impact is the SAGE Geoscience, uh, SAGE Science Fair Awards and SAGE stands for Student Award uh, for Geoscience Excellence. And this year in 2021, we gave out 800 awards um, and those have been international awards as well. Um, another thing that we do is we offer a number of different scholarships and awards for undergraduate students. So those include the Crawford Field Camp Scholarship, um, the Brunton Award, and the IDEA Scholarship that, um, that we have for undergraduate students to pursue their geoscience education. And the IDEA Scholarship um, was just renamed this past year. It was um, originally our minority scholarship, but um, we've looked at kind of how we can improve that scholarship and we renamed it as our as the idea scholarship and we spent a lot of time looking at the wording to make sure that um, it's inclusive and that it's accessible to um, a broad range of students um, to make sure that and, and looking at different barriers that could potentially be problematic um, for students that were applying for the scholarship. Um, scholarships for graduate students, including the Jean Harris Chrysler Scholarship, which is really, really important and really one of the big things that AWG really promotes and supports and is really proud of um, because this scholarship is to help women who have had their careers interrupted. So if their graduate school um, program, if they had to stop school for some time or some life event came up that made completing a degree difficult, they can apply for this scholarship and this money can be used for anything. It can be used um, for the books, for, the, for tuition, for fees, but it can also be used for food, for daycare, for anything that a woman needs because her, um, her trajectory has been interrupted. Um, we have additional research grants um, related um, in particular to the Paleontological Society. And then we offer travel grants because you know talking about getting out there and presenting the research, and one of the important things is to go to professional meetings. And then we also offer our Mentoring 365. So mentoring has evolved over the many years of AWG. And right now we are, are using the Mentoring 365 platform. In terms of what we do for exchange, we share with our community, um, share different news. So some of the things that we have, we have quarterly newsletters, we have um, monthly newsletters that go out to all of our members. Um, and we have one of the big things that we use to exchange information is we've, de is we've developed a distinguished lecturer program. And this is important for a couple of reasons. Number one, it's important um, because it is the exchange of scientific information or it could be the exchange of um, just discussions about how to, um, you know, how to navigate the, uh, the, the professional career. Um, but it's also really important because it gives the women who are on this um, program who are giving the distinguished presentations visibility because that's one of the things that we definitely need to increase diversity is the visibility um, and, and in our case particularly the visibility of women who are giving um, who are doing the work and making sure that we have these opportunities and that we have an easy to find list of the women who are doing excellent work. We also offer many field trips and this is um, at, the, uh, at the global level, we have field trips that are operated that are open to all of our members. And then we have chapters that are offering their own field trips. And we've been very engaged in professional meeting sessions like today, but also um, we have sponsored sessions that may be related to um, diversity, equity, inclusion issues. Uh, we have done workshops with GSA over, the, over many years to try to pr promote training. Um, we have different professional development opportunities. And again, we have Mentoring 365. So recognizing that mentoring is needed not only for students, but also for professionals at different levels of their careers as well. And then our last E, some examples of our last E is how we can enhance um, the professional careers of women. And so one of those particular things that we've been very active in doing is, is um, networking um, with other societies. And so for a long time, we've had a long relationship with some of the geoscience societies like GSA and AIPG, AGI and AGU. But more recently, we've been trying to reach out to more global societies as well. And so recently um, connected with the Asociación Paleontológica de Argentina and Sociedad Geológica de España. Um, and then another big part of our project, or another big project that AWG has been involved in 
is the advanced geo collaboration. And that has been primarily um, a partnership between the American Geophysical Union and the Earth Science Women's Network. And I'll tell you a little bit more about that project in a couple of slides. And then another recent um, project program that we are involved in is the GeoAscend Research Coordination Network. And so um, AWG is a member of the steering committee. Um, and the goal of this project is try to improve the culture and climate of professional geoscience um, societies and organizations. And then a big part of what we do to enhance, enhance women's professional careers is that we try to offer professional recognition for women. So I mentioned that the Distinguished Lecturer Program is one way to do that. But another way that we can do that is by offering awards, nominating women for awards. Um, and that is one of the challenges that women face is that um, there's a lot of work that goes into nominating women, nominating any person for any kind of award. And um, we need to increase the visibility. We need to increase the number of women who are nominated in those positions. And AWG itself has created a few specific um, awards to recognize women. So for their professional excellence. So we have the professional excellence awards and every year we offer an award to a woman in academia, um, someone in um, industry and somebody in government. And then we also have the Outstanding Educator Award, which we have um, is probably our longest running award. And then more recently, just about two or three years ago, we started the Mavis Kent Mid-Career Excellence Award because recognizing that we need to have a recognition at all stages that excellent, uh, recognizing the professional excellence at the kind of end or later in women's stages is very, very good and very important. But in order to get to those kind of advanced levels, they need to be recognized early on in their career too. Um, and then other ways of enhancing the uh, enhancing um, an enhancement is that we have short courses and we have reception events for career development and networking. So one example that's always common is we try to host breakfast at Geological Society of America meetings. We also offer leadership opportunities, leadership in the chapters, leadership in the board of directors, and then another important part of what we do is that we offer a review um, resume review service. So members of AWG can send us a copy of their resumes. We can review it and give feedback. And we've got a, a team of um, a team of professionals who have different professional experience to help with those resume reviews. And so more recently, so this is kind of the, you know the previous work is all the work that we have done. Um, more recently, specific actions that we have been focused on, diversity, equity, and inclusion action. Um, some of the specific topics or projects that have been happening is that there have been a lot of workshops on implicit and bias, microaggressions. Um, part of the advanced geo project is that um, holding bystander intervention workshops. Um, and so, and many of these have been coordinated by the chapters. So like I said, all of this work is, I'm presenting all of the work that so many other people, so many people have, have participated in. Um, and so the chapter events have been very huge and with, with the um, increasing comfort of virtual opportunities and virtual events, these events have been great for chapters to network with each other um, and for chapters to expand the reach of who can participate and offer this to all of our AWG members outside of chapters too. Another important thing that we've been looking at is reviewing all of our scholarships and awards to make sure that we have um, equitable and inclusive language and requirements that we're not putting in any unnecessary barriers in applying for a scholarship or an award to make sure that they can, we can help as many people as possible and it's trying to also communicate those opportunities more widely too because we understand that um, finding opportunities for scholarships and awards can be really difficult and challenging. Another primary focus that we've been looking at is international growth and networking and trying again, this is related to the accessibility and participation and this also goes back to reviewing our scholarships and awards too because um, we want to make sure that we're, we're growing in our international um, membership and we want to make sure that the opportunities that we have are also accessible and so many of our student grant awards are um, available to international um, international students and we want to make sure that that's clear and, and communicated um, and then also kind of some of the other things that we have done is partnering with other organizations um, that like I had mentioned um, and then focusing on the UN sustainable development goals as well 
And the last, I've already kind of alluded to the communication, but we really wanna make sure that we're getting our information out there um, as accessible as possible. And so we've increased the frequency, we've increased our methods, and especially we've had some great uh, members who have taken on um, helping with the social media, starting a Snapchat account. So some of those things that we had not done previously, we've kind of tried to increase some of that. And then how we're sharing events. So we're sharing all of the events, like I mentioned, the chapters working with other chapters for more um, widely networking beyond just kind of the local chapter region um, and connecting with all of the AWG members because there are many members across across the world that do not have a chapter and there's not enough, uh, they don't have the enough connections to start their own chapter. Um, and so are really making sure that we have resources that are available to the members at large as well. Um, and then again, re remember um, how we're communicating with our affiliated societies as well. And so I already mentioned that we have this advanced geo partnership between the Earth Science Women's Network and um, the Association for Geo, uh, the, uh, American Geophysical Union. Um, and so I just want to kind of touch on this. Yesterday, Advanced Geo um, did do a presentation and a panel as well. And so I just kind of want to mention some of the goals of what this is. So this is an NSF funded project and they are finishing. Um, they actually asked for an extension so that they could continue doing some of the work because of the disruption during the COVID time. But their goal was to collect data and analyze data about workplace climate experiences in the geosciences and ecological sciences. Um, and so they have submitted, they have completed those surveys and they're starting to go through the data that they have related to those surveys and presenting that information. Um, one of the goals of their project is to um, create bystander intervention training um, that can help understand how to help change the climate. And they have been successful at doing that and they have run, um, I forget the number that they presented yesterday, but they have run many, many, um, many, many workshops already they have trained the train. They have had trained the trainer workshops, and so they are um, increasing their their reach. And they have been very successful at kind of reaching a broad um, group, a broad audience um, with these programs. Um, they want to develop teaching modules on sexual misconduct and bullying for use in research ethics training courses. Um, they want to disseminate training workshops, webinars, and teaching modules via partnerships with professional societies. And they want to develop a sustainable model that can be transferred to other STEM disciplines as well. Um, and so uh, they are looking at, so they are asking for an extension of their ongoing research, but then they are also looking at the future of where this work can go so that they can evaluate, like I mentioned, they're doing a lot of these workshops. They want to evaluate the effectiveness of these workshops um, into the future. Okay. So, over the past year, uh, or I guess earlier in the year, we did send out a member survey. We wanted to know um, what the members feel about AWG and also what we need to do moving forward to make sure that we continue to meet the needs, needs of our members. And I wanted to put out some of the information um, that is here to uh, kind of share some of the responses and kind of some of the reasons why AWG exists and kind of continues to exist. Um, specifically, I highlighted some of the important things that a lot of a lot of the comments in our survey talked about the need for support, um, so the interest, the goal of, of getting included, um, networking opportunities and community. I think the support and the community are both very related um, to not only have the opportunity for professional um, exposure, but also just to have that a group of people that can relate to their experiences. Um, invisibility, or sorry, the visibility of women is important as well. And that was highlighted many times. Um, having an environment that's encouraging and then the mentoring opportunities were all um, very important to our members. And then the other um, question that we asked too is because, you know, in, you know, in the time of there's so many different societies, there's so many different organizations. Um, AWG is really kind of broadly or kind of specifically about um, these development and building this community and kind of trying to gauge how does this relate to um, other societies like societies like GSA, AAPG, AGU. Um, you know, why stay with AWG when there are all these other professional reasons to be in these other types of organizations? And these were some of the responses that we got. And again, the, the network um, 
the safe space, the empowerment, the opportunities to help, uh, to get help, but also the opportunities to feel that they can help others and change and make a difference too were some of the ones that uh, were really important. And again, kind of a bridge between other organizations, which I think is important because that has been something that AWG is trying to do as well by connecting with other organizations as well. Oops, so let me go back here. So my last slide is just kind of looking at, again, looking at those responses and where AWG is going to go moving forward. What are some of the actions that we hope to do so that we can increase inclusion, equity, diversity, and accessibility in geoscience? And so, like I said, we want to partner with other organizations um, and kind of reach out and, and connect with other organizations to make sure that um, there are so many groups that are trying to do the same thing so that we all um, kind of have strength in numbers. Um, and then promoting outreach activities because we want to make sure that we're reaching out at all different stages um, and making sure that we have a, you know, that the geoscience is accessible to, to young kids too, that they kind of see the value in a geoscience career and opportunities. Keep going with our training programs, that there is a lot of good ideas of what we can continue to do with training opportunities. Um, in addition to the advanced geotypes of trainings, other kinds of professional trainings are things that um, that were requested. And with the virtual world, I think is, is more accessible for us all and more comfortable for many people too. And supporting actions um, of women of, of other organizations um, as well. And then continue with our distinguished lecturer program and improve, improve the diversity of the members that are part of that program. Continuing with our mentorship program too, because a lot of um, the advanced geo results too kind of indicate that need and need for mentorship and also a lot of um, recent discussions about mentorship really show that you need to have diverse mentors, like a diverse set of mentors that are there to support you. That one mentor is not the only, um, that you, one mentor will serve one need, but you need other mentors to serve other needs as you go through your professional development. Um, and then any other additional activities was kind of another comment that we had received. So um, with that slide, I will thank you all and um, look forward to chatting with you later. Yeah, I'm sure we'll have lots of questions during the panel and definitely join AWG if you're not a member. It's super cheap. It's way cheaper than an APG. <laughs> and the field trips are pretty fun. We're actually running one to Hot Springs in Arkansas the first weekend in November. So if you want to come to Arkansas with us, let me know. Next on the list is Kat Campbell, and she is going to present about Jedi in APG, supported by Meredith. Kat loves um, that each rock tells a story, and it's our job as geoscientists to translate that story and understand how it fits into the framework that is our understanding of the natural world. And my advisor at Miami was always very into telling us, tell me the story of the rock. What is the, what is the rock's story and then he'd just walk away and we'd be like okay whatever how <laughs> for a fun fact I really liked Kat's fun fact she got a letter from her homeowners association asking her to remove the nine foot t-rex skeleton from her front yard and that letter is now framed in her house so that's her proud geo moment Meredith who's a supporting author on this uh is passionate about geoscience um because everybody, whether they acknowledge it or not, has a vested interest in learning about our planet and helping people to understand the place we call home, learn more about natural resources we utilize, and develop an affinity for sustainability, environmental stewardship, technology, and science are privileges and responsibilities that she takes very seriously. Meredith's fun fact is that she can juggle, and she has been a, a long-form comedic imp improviser for six years now. So I think we need to have a whole separate meeting where we watch her juggle and do comedy improv. I think that will be our next special session. <laughs> All right, over to you, Kat. Thank you, Chris. All right. Are you guys good? Can you see that? Yes, I can. Excellent, thank you. Well, it is an honor to be part of this uh, this group of speakers and panelists, um, the presentations so far have blown me away. So thank you for that. Um, Meredith, John, and I um, would like to present about diversity, equity, and inclusion within AAPG, looking beyond the business case. Well, let's get started. So first of all, who are we? Um, 
We are the Stimulating Diversity and Inclusion Special Interest Group Leadership. And the Stimulating Group actually began as a group of individuals who wanted to introduce change at AAPP meetings. And this was working with um, Lauren Bergenheyer at uh, the Salt Lake meeting several years ago. And we had a group of people come together and contribute financially, just personal donations, along with a couple of businesses to bring um, an unconscious bias speaker to a lunch. And that was the first time something like that has ever happened at AAPG. So that was a really exciting opportunity. So from there, under the guidance and wisdom of Denise Cox, we created the Stimulating Diversity and Inclusion um, AAPG Special Interest Group. And this is our mission statement and just a few highlights of it. The biggest thing is that we want to promote awareness and respect for diversity and the importance of diversity and inclusivity in order for all of us to function and be successful. Um, we're trying to provide solutions for AAPG to foster that inclusion and really recognize the population that is being served by looking at the membership as a whole for AAPG. And we'll get into some survey results later that show how important this is and how far we have to go on this. We are committed to improving the future of AAPG. We want to unite all of the members and we really want to have productive discussions. We wanna challenge the way things have been done and try to make it better. So starting off a couple of definitions, what exactly is JEDI? And the definition of this is justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion. Some keywords that we've heard a lot today. Uh, JEDI is fostering a sense of belonging by centering, valuing, and amplifying the voices, perspectives, and styles of those who experience more barriers based on their identities. And we'll look a little bit more into those identities shortly. So justice is fixing the system to offer equal access to both tools and opportunities. And this is absolutely essential because if it's not equal for everyone to have access to this, simple things like presenting, um, walking into an AAPG meeting and seeing other people that look like you and respecting and are respecting you, then it's not fun to be part of this organization and there's no point. Uh, Verna Myers is a phenomenal speaker. She is described as a cultural change catalyst and she's truly captured the Jedi message in this quote. She says, diversity is being invited to the party, inclusion is being asked to dance. And then this last part was recently added to her quote, equality is being on the party planning committee. And that's what we really want to do with this. We want to change AAPG to be more diverse, more inclusive, but we really want to see leadership that truly represents the body of AAPG, the membership. So going back to definitions, let's talk a little bit more about diversity. Diversity can be enigmatic. What does it actually mean? And how do you prioritize or organize that seemingly infinite num the seemingly infinite number of ways that we are all unique? A uh, generally accepted methodology is using something called the dimensions of diversity. And there are lots of different ways that the dimensions are grouped. I personally like the four dimensions of diversity, which are classified as internal, external, organizational, and worldview. So looking into each of those a little bit more specifically, internal is something that you're born into, such as race, ethnicity, um, sexual orientation, cultural identity, gender at birth, External is related, but not directly something that you're born with. So uh, your interests, your education, your religion, where you're physically located or where you're born. Organizational, these are uh, functional diversity characteristics or traits, and these are typically assigned by an organization. Those include job function, place of work, and seniority within a corporate structure. Worldview, the final one, is an amalgamation of the other types of diversity. And this is something that can change over time based on our experiences. This can be political view, moral compass, and something like the outlook on life. So considering all those different ways that we can be unique, why is it important to have representatives from all different types of diversity in our businesses and in our societies? So if you haven't seen the data, it is pretty significant and work, worth a review. Jedi, having Jedi works. Um, a look at the Fortune 1000 list of companies shows how important female CEOs are for a company's success. While only 5% of the companies in the Fortune 1000 list run organizations, those organizations contribute 7% of the total revenue of the Fortune 1000 list. 
Those companies also outperform on the S&P 500 index. In short, women are good for leadership and they're good for business. Organizations with above average gender diversity and levels of employment tend to outperform companies that don't have that diversity and engagement, and that's by 50% or more. Uh, looking at the 2015 McKinsey report on diversity and inclusion, I highly recommend looking at that report. Companies in the top quarter for racial and ethnic diversity are 35% more likely to surpass peers. And this is interesting, while those in the same bracket for gender diversity are 15% more likely to do the same. So a little bit of diversity helps, but a lot of diversity goes a long way. The Harvard Business Review has a great study, and they define 2D or two-dimensional diversity as both inherent and acquired diversity. Inherent diversity are the attributes someone's born with. So again, those, um, those internal, so sexual orientation, ethnicity, and then the acquired diversities are more the worldview, the organizational, and those are acquired through life experience. Um, I mean, like poverty or alternative schooling. Companies with leadership that exhibited two-dimensional diversity, so having experiences outside of what's considered the norm, outperformed their peers and were more likely to experience greater innovation and they proved able to attract new markets, which is something that is absolutely huge in business. Now let's look beyond the business case. That business case is clear. Diversity of thought, analytical thinking, collective accuracy, objectivity, so many of those key business terms that we hear all the time, having diversity will lead to a better bottom line. And the same is true for societies. But what about the other piece of it, the actual human experience of the people who represent diverse backgrounds. AAPG is composed of its members. When we alienate the members, we as AAPG lose. Take for example, this member's experience with registering for image for this year's meeting. Um, I don't identify as male or female. When I went to register for AAPG's image meeting, I was saddened as I was forced to click on one or the other. What about those of us who are geologists but different? Will they want to attend again if there's a barrier to simply registering for an event, let alone feeling excluded when you're out on the floor and the only person who say looks like you speaks your language? For one of my recent president's columns for the Rocky Mountain Association of Geologists, I asked friends, colleagues, and peers to share recent stories of harassment, discrimination, and just general bad experiences that have happened in the past um, five, less than 10 years. And these were related to internal or external diversity. The resulting compilation was actually difficult to read. I had a number of people write to me and say that it was, it was very hard to read some of these stories. The stories ranged from a mom being told she couldn't travel because she should be home with her kids, to a woman being forcibly kissed at a professional event, and another woman being told she was not getting a job because the hiring manager preferred to work with men. All of these people are scientists, and all of these people are AAPG members. We need to work to maintain this diversity and we need to work to grow our diversity. Now let's look at some workplace numbers. Just over half, 55% of American, work, American workers agree that their place of work has diversity and inclusivity policies in place. That's a majority of workers, but it also means that nearly half of the workforce is employed by organizations that aren't creating safe and welcoming environments for their employees. Think about how this impacts the safety, well-being, retention, and the overall experience and potential economic success of a company, which can, in turn, hurt its employees. According to, a, to that Harvard Business Review study that I referenced earlier, quote, without diverse leadership, women are 20% less likely than straight white men to win endorsement for their ideas. People of color are 24% less likely, and those who identify as LGBT are 21% less likely. A lack of diversity in the leadership of an organization hampers innovation. It prohibits members of minority groups from being recognized for their contributions, and it fails to meet client expectations. If people don't feel safe, respected, and part of a process, they will not want to belong. This is why we need justice, equality, diversity, and inclusion in the AAPG. So what are the obstacles we face within AAPG? We have a lack of diversity. We have significant unconscious bias. And what does that make us look like as a whole? I love this quote from Maya Angelou. We all should know that diversity makes for rich tapestry. And we must understand that all the threads of the tapestry are equal in value, no matter what their color. So let's look at some of the data here. This pie chart shows four different age brackets from a 2019 survey to AAPG members. 
For members less than 25 years of age, so school or just starting career is 23%. For early to mid-career, 26 to 40 years of age is 24%. And for mid to late career, 40 to 60 years of age is 21%. And you'll notice the largest group, 61 to greater than 80 years of age is 32%. So what kind of tapestry are we weaving when we have such disparate age groups? Also gender, there's a low representation of women. Only 21% of the organization is women. Looking at leadership and BIPOC, only four individuals have held leadership positions. That's only 2.4%. And that's not acceptable because that doesn't represent the population of AAPG. Part of what we did with stimulating diversity and inclusion with the SIG, we did a survey that was open to all members of AAPG. Unfortunately, we only received 70 responses, which also kind of sets the stage for where this stands as far as importance to AAPG. But these numbers are staggering. 65% of people feel that they belong at AAPG and 59% feel proud to be a member of AAPG. That's not acceptable. We, we need to have those numbers closer to 100%. 46% feel that leadership supports AAPG's value of diversity and inclusion. That's terrifying. Think about the other 50%. It, it's just, it's not acceptable. We can't, we can't let that happen. Only 18% of respondents felt that AAPG has done a good job of providing programs that promote diversity and inclusion. This shows a huge gap in something that we really need to fill and take care of. So what are we doing to try to, to solve this and help it? Well, uh, stimulating diversity and inclusion, our SIG, we're providing diversity and inclusion training by Michelle Ann. She's the creator of the master's class, which is a neuroscience-based diversity and inclusion program. We started with three workshops. The first one is mitigating cognitive bias, and then the adaptive leader, and coming up, we have growth essentials. <clears throat> and we're really excited to see the, the results of these programs. The problem is that the people that are here are the people that care and the people that want to make a difference. What we need to do is have these be part of HOD and part of other leadership um, programs at AAPG. We need to make sure that we provide resources to leadership to make sure that society events are actually representative and inclusive of the diversity of our members. And one of the biggest things, we need to challenge those policies and procedures that lack inclusion. Who are the people who are making decisions for nominating and for awards? We need to make sure that we're honoring our entire membership. We're just getting started. There is so much left to do, and I can't wait to work with all of you seeing these programs that you're talking about. We can make significant change and I can't wait to be part of it with you. These are a few of the resources that we used for our presentation. Um, there are so many sources of data out there. Um, but I recommend checking out the Harvard Business Review. The World Economic Forum has phenomenal information on um, business cases for diversity. And then the McKinsey Report in 2015 is another great resource. So that is all, thank you so much. Awesome, thank you, Kat, that was fantastic. All right, next up we have Aileen Doran. She's gonna talk about equity, diversity, and inclusion in geoscience. Uh, it's a time to listen, learn, and act. And she is passionate about geoscience because you can meet so many different people and see so much of the world, but overall rocks are fascinating and being able to study so many different environments through them and try to relate this to modern day challenges like sourcing and resources is really enjoyable and every day really is different. A fun fact about Eileen is that she got really into science fiction when she was doing her PhD, especially old books that had interesting cover art. So now she has over 300 books in her collection that have super cool cover art. Rochelle's going to play the video because it's an MP4 file. Hello everyone and thank you for coming along to today's session and for listening in for my talk today. So my name is Hello everyone 
and thank you for coming along to today's session and for listening in for my talk today. So my name is Aileen and I'm currently a postdoctoral researcher at UCD in ICRAG. Um, but today I'm going to be talking to you about a project I've been involved with for the past year or so called the Equality, Diversity and Inclusion in Geosciences or EDIG Initiative. And for say, I just want to say a massive thank you to all of the EDIG volunteers who weren't able to join us today, but also the session organizers for inviting us to speak. So the purpose of today's talk um, is really to share our own experiences about from the EDIG project and kind of show some data from an initial survey that we ran last summer. And so for the next few slides, I'm going to just give a bit more of a context and go into that survey data in a bit more detail. In terms of where the EDIG project stemmed from, I guess, um, overall, we are a volunteer led initiative that originated from internal EDI conversations from our founding stakeholder, ICRAG, to the Research Centre. And really, EDIG started as a suggestion for a workshop on unconscious bias and certain training focusing on gender based challenges. And so as we started to have these conversations and really think about what we could do in terms of our own research centre, there's a few things that happened. Uh, in particular, we went to a very virtual landscape. Everyone had to start doing things online. Conferences suddenly had a complete um, virtual content. And so we were able to really connect on a global and international level that hadn't really been possible before at the same level. And so roughly at the same time, we decided to run a two day conference focusing on promoting awareness of these challenges and trying to promote progressive action in the geosciences community. Um, and also we decided to step away from just focusing on gender based challenges and include more topics in the conversations. And so in line with that, we decided to form a separate working group and open it up to other people outside of our research center um, and also to engage with lots of different stakeholders and uh, to run a survey to better understand the challenges and experiences of other people in our community. And so in terms of this survey, the kind of main purpose of it was really to help us understand other people's experiences and challenges to help us structure and run the conference. So this was launched in the summer of 2020 to learn more about these experiences and the results of this were directly used in the conference and were given to speakers to help form talks and, things and different aspects. So we had a really great response with 708 participants from 58 countries, but it is really important to point out here that the majority of responses were from Europe and North America. So we still have quite a lot to do in terms of getting a more global representative um, view of this kind of EDI related challenges, but this is a really great starting point and we're able to use the results of the kind of demographics to help figure out where we need to expand our own network and um, include in future events. And just as a highlight, if anyone is interested in looking at um, a couple more videos that focus more closely on the survey results, uh, today's is going to be kind of a quick overview. They're available on our YouTube channel called EDIG Conference, and we're happy to look at and share that. And also, we are currently working on a report that we do plan to release online that displays the, the kind of results of the survey. And just lastly, um, Dr. Jess Franklin and Dr. Anna Bidcoat, who are both uh, volunteers with EDIG, go into a lot more detail on this, and especially the demographic breakdown, which is really important in terms of looking at the larger data set, because it helps us to understand the kind of relationships and the links in a lot more detail. So they're available on our YouTube uh, channel. But for the next few slides, I'm just going to give you an overview of EDI related questions. So as part of the survey, one of the sections of it was to ask participants how, how strongly they either disagree or agree with several different statements. So the first one of these were, there are issues with prejudice in my workplace or organization. And so 58% of participants stated that they either somewhat agree or strongly agree that there are issues of prejudice in the workplace or organization. Then as we move into unconscious bias, there is 73% of participants who agree that this is an issue in their workplace organization. And then the other 
um, part was about inequity, exclusion and other forms of discrimination in workplace and organisation and 58% agree with this. So I guess it's kind of important to think here that while these figures probably don't come as a surprise to most people in the session, they really show that these are still really prevalent issues, that people are still hugely affected by it. And I think this is really interesting because there's still quite a few people out there who would dismiss these kind of EDI related issues. And they say it's uh, we've come a long way and that there's not really much else to do. But I think this clearly shows that we still have a lot of work to do. Okay, so one of the next sections of the survey asked people about either if they had witnessed prejudice, inequity, bias, exclusion, or any other form of discrimination against others, and also if they had themselves experienced these issues. And so I think just to begin with the, the witnessing aspect, 86% um, of participants said yes, they have either frequently, sometimes or rarely uh, witnessed these issues against other people, uh, with 28% of participants saying that they have frequently witnessed uh, these kind of different issues against others. Then if we move into the experiencing of prejudice, inequity, bias, exclusion, or other forms of discrimination, it's 72% um, that have frequently, rarely, or sometimes experienced these, and it's 19% who said that they frequently have experienced these issues. And so this actually brings up, I think, quite an interesting point in terms of, is this uh, experiencing slightly lowered witnessing because people often dismiss their own experiences? And I know I myself have done that where I've experienced something and I've kind of justified it and told myself that it's not really what I thought was happening or um, different aspects like that. So I think it's quite an interesting conversation to have around that as well. Um, because really, that is probably a much higher statistics if we did it again now after a year. Okay, so for this figure here, what it's showing is a summary of the top issues reported by respondents that they have themselves experienced. And so we ask people a little bit more detail about the type of issues and discrimination that they've experienced. And so the top ones were gender identity and gender-based issues and sexual harassment was closely following this. I think it's also important to keep in mind um, just the demographic data plays a really key role here. Um, with the top respondents being female identifying. And so following sexual harassment, we get into professional and job status related discrimination, racism, disability discrimination and ageism. And so this kind of information and um, uh, kind of answers were directly used to help plan some of the sessions in our conference because um, it really helped us figure out what we needed to be addressing and talking about in more detail as well and kind of bring all of these issues together in one area to discuss. So toward the end of the survey, we wanted to ask people about their kind of awareness of EDI related initiatives in their workplace or organisation. So we have a pretty positive result where 75% of people said, yes, absolutely, workplace has EDI related initiatives. Uh, which is quite positive out of 708 participants. But then when we ask people about their views of the effectiveness of EDI initiatives in the workplace or organization, it was 47%, so almost half of participants who were unsure if they're effective in their workplace organization, which um, I think brings up a lot of other issues and challenges because it is great to have EDI initiatives, but how do we make sure that they're actually effective and useful for the people who need them as well. This brings us to a quick summary of the EDIG conference itself. And so the EDIG conference ran over two days with 14 supporting partners. I just really quickly wanted to say again, a massive thank you. All the logos on the side represent those uh, supporting partners. And we had over 700 registrants, which is really, really positive. And in terms of the structure, it was broken into three sessions um, following the uh, topics of where have we come from, where are we now and where are we going? And then finishing off with a workshop on a conscious bias, which was supported by iCRAG and IGI. So in terms of what we learned, really, um, each session covered 
a huge amount of aspects. We had 17 speakers on a huge amount of information. And while the kind of core concept of the conference was really about bringing people together who don't often see themselves involved in these conversations and helping to promote awareness of the challenges experienced by people, there is a huge amount of topics covered in terms of how diversity has changed over the past 50 years, um, in terms of intersectionality, resource sections with lots of amazing different tools and kind of uh, articles and webinars and links and things like this that help you figure out what you can do to make geosciences more equitable. But a really key message is awareness is only the first step. We all need to take these steps to act as well. And really, that doesn't need to be something like organizing a conference. There's lots of different things, and most of us are probably involved in stuff like organizing seminars, posting on social media. And there's really something that we can all do to ensure that these activities are more accessible and inclusive. For example, on social media, um, if you post images, for example, Make sure that you're including alt or alternative text on your images so more people can engage and with your content and make it more inclusive to a wider audience. And lastly, I just want to give a bit of a call out if anyone wants to get involved with the EDA project, uh, or if you just want to chat through about what we're planning on doing, or um, if you're if you're associated with a different organization and like to get involved please reach out to us on our email um, and also we have several social media accounts as well. Um, so I'm just going to finish up with a massive thank you for coming along to my talk and I hope you enjoy the rest of the session. Well, thank you very much Rochelle for playing that through the MP4. Okay, last but not least before the panel session, Rochelle's going to talk to us now about creating and promoting gender equality and diversity in professional geologic societies. And this work was uh, supported by the AAPG Women's Network. There's a long list of authors. I'm sure she'll show you. Um, Rochelle loves discovering and creating and inventing something new and adding it to the scientific literature. She also really enjoys spending time outside mapping and collecting data. And she always lives in cool places like the Southwest or Montana. She's a first generation <laughs> college student from a working class family. And she's overcome many financial and resource barriers over her years to achieve her advanced degrees. She really loves her family and is proud to provide opportunities for them that they wouldn't otherwise have access to. So I'm gonna hand it over to Rochelle to present. And then after she's done, we're gonna move into the panel Q&A session. So you can start thinking of questions now if you wanna go ahead and type them in the chat, that works for me. Otherwise we can talk through it after Rochelle's presentation. Great, thank you so much, Chris. Thank you all for making it to the, the last talk of the day. And I just really appreciate your patience and working together to actually pull this thing off. So thank you. Okay, sorry, I'm just trying to find, here it is. Okay. So uh, the talk that I will be giving today, the title of it, uh, I believe Chris already read it, but it is uh, how we can, yeah. basically create gender equity and diversity in our professional geological societies going forward. Um, I know this is a common issue across many different uh, types of geological societies. Uh, we are using data from AAPG as sort of a, um, as a way to assess the situation and go forward. This is a huge thank you to all of my co-authors. A lot of these people are a part of a PG Women's Network and the Stimulating Diversity SIG. And then also um, we have a few others sprinkled in there, but all these people are part of a PG. And then uh, we reached out to some other professional societies for data as well. And there was a whole group of people who were involved in collating and giving us data that we then put into this study. So um, the main part of this talk will be focusing on APG, GSA, and data from the AGU. And then also um, this is currently under peer review. And part of that peer review process was to also look and analyze data globally 
So we did reach out to uh, the women in Australia and then also uh, the European Geoscience Union. But that data has not been yet incorporated just because there's some technical issues with knowing names and genders and things like that. So there's a whole host of things that um, there will be a part two to this later. And then lastly, um, we would like to thank Dr. Christine Williams. She is a professor of sociology at UT Austin. And we met with her starting, gosh, over a year ago. And she mentored us to sort of make sure that we had the background literature that she had written about 10 years ago, starting with the AAPG and some women from the APG um, who had set up a foundation or some sort of uh, consortium to have this work started. And um, just, I wanted to draw your attention to a book that she recently published. It is now available on Amazon. So special thank you to Christine for her mentorship and also for providing uh, some real general quality based material, sociology material just to make sure that our study was grounded um, in a classic sociology approach. Um, these are the people from uh, the AAPG Women's Network and we actually have a few new ones, so this will need to be updated. But um, just to give a little bit of my background, I started working with the AWG originally in 2016 when I started my uh, PhD. So I founded uh, a local chapter in El Paso, Texas, referred to as the Sun City chapter. And that's when I sort of began this journey of you know, bringing uh, equity to women and others. Um, so it started a bit ago. From there, I um, went and started as a board of I was on the board of directors as the secretary from 2019, or sorry, 2017 to 2019 at AWG. And then um, from 2020 to 2021, I was the co-chair uh, of AAPG Women's Network. And then I am currently serving as a liaison to the Geo Latinas organization. All right, so to start off, the main issue that we are seeing right now, or at least up until 2017, I'm looking forward to new studies that show post pandemic, what the statistics are. But you can see through time that the degrees were relatively keeping up with men, 2010. And then as we go through uh, 2013, 2015, and into 2017, it slightly increased, and then we see a major drop off. I'm sure that this has changed uh, greatly due to the pandemic. But you can see that men are receiving a slightly more and much more um, degrees in 2017. So overall, we were keeping pace, and then we dropped. And then you'll notice that there's a huge disparity between the number of men receiving degrees compared to women and then the jobs, those that are actually working a geoscience job. So even though women, especially in 2010, were relatively graduating at the same levels with a geoscience degree, they actually have significantly less jobs in the geosciences. So this was this study in this paper by Gonzalez from uh, the AGI was where we begin um, this public or this manuscript and this presentation. So why is this happening? And we think that we can use the data from uh, the geoscience professional societies to explain or at least provide somewhat of an explanation to why we're seeing this. So we think that it could be due to, along with a whole bunch of other things that everyone else that presented today uh, brought up, but some of the main bullet points that we uh, think why this is happening is that there is a lack of visible role models. So not only for women, but maybe for other genders, races, and ethnicities. So you just don't see women um, at the top. There are workforce retention issues, limited mentors and advisors. And at times there are emotionally unsupportive classroom and work environments. There is gender-based isolation and discrimination. 
And there is also bias or nepotistic hiring and layoff practices. And that is a bullet point that I think we will especially see once some of the data from the pandemic really starts hitting the mainstream. There is also poor marketing of geoscience programs to minorities and to women. There's also a difference in career goals between men and women. Uh, I feel especially passionate about this one. I think men and women value different things and are rewarded uh, differently. So maybe something that women generally see as being more valuable, uh, they aren't rewarded or compensated for it in the same way as the things that men see valuable within our profession. Another thing uh, that I think plagues us, and I know this is something that I have experienced, especially during my PhD, was low self-confidence and self-efficacy -effic among women and minority geoscientists. Women of color experience uh, double blind or double jeopardy. I know this is nothing new, and I know that they can speak much more on this. Also, there are family unfriendly policies. So a lot of times I hear a story about women who struggle that have children or are caretaking maybe a, a sick parent, something like that. There is also a substantial amount of physical, sexual and emotional abuse that takes place with our profession. Things that are very um, obvious and severe to things that um, some other people had talked about like microaggressions and things like that. We feel that this list is comprehensive, but by no means is complete. And again, I'm just a single person with a single voice and perspective. So over the long term, so you take up all these um, things that could happen to women over time and you stack them up on each other. And this can severely limit a women's career and the diversity of the candidate pool for prestigious leadership positions. This is within professional organizations and even within academia and within um, corporations. Also technical and service awards. So there is a big difference between the number of women who receive purely just service awards and those who are receiving technical awards that often have more weight within our profession. The number of publications and citations that if you pursue an academic career can directly affect your progression as an academic. All of those uh, things that we had talked about can severely limit your ability to publish, even just your ability to write, which is something I've personally struggled with. So being able to produce a publication because of struggles that you have and the discrimination that you're faced with. Also, because you may not have that publication record, uh, it may affect your ability to be a distinguished lecturer, which often in academia is one of the most prestigious positions that you can uh, receive and it can greatly enhance your career and your ability to um, receive money for presentations and uh, for consulting gigs, for promotions, things like this. And then I just left technical as a general term. This is something that we often discuss in our APG uh, women's network group is just being viewed as being a technical geoscientist. Um, this is maybe something that's more um, sort of bias in APG than elsewhere. So again, by not having uh, access to some of these positions and honors and awards because of the discrimination you face over your career uh, will greatly impact your progression. And that leads into many other things. So technical uh, progression, your financial progression, um, things like that. So looking closely at AAPG's data, this is uh, what the data set looks like for the executive committee. So this is um, within the executive committee, this is AAPG's president, vice president, secretary, so at the highest level of governance of AAPG. This also looks at the Division of Professional Affairs, the Division of Environmental Geoscientists, and the Energy and Minerals Division with AAPG. And you can see that over time, we made pretty um, good gains since, you know, the 19... 17 when the organization was originally founded. So right now we're currently sitting or in 2020, we were sitting at 30%. 
but you can see, and I know this is no, um, this is not a secret and it's very obvious to everyone, especially sitting in this webinar right now that this is simply not fair and it's not enough. In terms of the award data, so um, this is just all the awards compiled together, all of AAPG's awards. 17% um, of women have received awards since 2011. And if you go back to 2017, it's only 13%. Please note that we did add an other category here because we simply couldn't tell the gender based off of the name. And please also note that historically, due to the nature of APG and its typically conservative um, attendees, there was never a category for like an other gender. So most ever, all the reporting has been in male or female, which is something that I'm really grateful that the APG stimulating SIG is looking to change going forward. The, um, just a, one thing to note, um, that the Sydney Powers Memorial Award, it's APG's highest honor, has never been received by a woman, even though we have um, time and time again nominated very, very deserving women, women like Robbie Grease, et cetera. Um, and then the one award that is gender balanced within APG has been um, the award that I know Meredith was a part of creating uh, the Young Professional Exemplary Service Award. So that was just an award that was created since 2017. That has been gender balanced. This is looking at all of AAPG's awards. So you can see that it's a long list of different types of awards for different disciplines. And overall, women um, have received very few, except for the Distinguished Service Award. You can see that we receive um, a higher percentage there which probably comes as no surprise. And then also um, the Young Professionals Exemplary Award, and then also the Teacher of the Year Award. So that's more off to the right-hand side of the screen. So mostly, uh, and I think that also feeds into a huge AAPG bias is that teachers are often female. In terms of AAPG's publications, uh, distinguished lecture roles and technical roles, through time, uh, you can see that, again, this and these often feed more into the academia side of APG, but women are greatly underrepresented. And one thing that I would, I've personally, and I know there are people in this room who are really trying to change this, are the distinguished lecture positions. You can see that there's only 7% are being hosted by women. And I think that really is telling and feeds into um, why the academic side of AAPG is especially um, favoritism or favors men. Here we compiled a chart uh, showing what these statistics, how they stack up against other professional societies. You can see that for AGU, so this is the upper left-hand corner, that um, where you see green, that is where we are on target and meeting the percentage of women. So the gray bar shows you the overall percentage of women in the organization. So it hovers around 20%. And then it goes down, um, down to even, you know, I think there's a little bit like 18, 19%. And then you can see that in the green, that's where we're meeting the target. So we're meeting the percentage of women as sort of a benchmark. And then the red is where we're not actually receiving our, we're not actually giving those awards. So APG falls short. You can also see that um, AGU in the middle, they uh, have a higher percentage of women hovering close to 30%, but yet they are still falling short giving women awards. And you can see though, that there is a bright light that we have the GSA, typically the GSA female, uh, awardee or membership is above 30% and the awards actually can greatly exceed um, the female membership. I hope that going forward and by our continued work as a collective that all geoscience societies can actually increase their female membership to match that of the females that are graduating with a geology degree and that they can also receive at a minimum um, the percentage or the awards that match their membership totals. 
So we also had a call to action section in our manuscript, and we are calling to eliminate sexual harassment, discrimination, and microaggressions within the AAPG organization. Working with the Stimulating Diversity SIG to implement uh, JEDI training, which they have already done and we're grateful for. Um, the one thing that we also would like to see more of is that this is sort of more mandated, if you will, within AAPG. So it's not just people who are generally interested in JEDI. People who are interested in JEDI are not typically a part of the issue. It's those who um, maybe don't understand what it is or don't really care to understand what it is. So perhaps people who are in leadership positions and then also uh, staff members within the organization. Um, also, women need to be nominated for awards and positions in significantly higher numbers by their peers. This is something that we have tackled. Uh, AAPG Women's Network, I created a database over last Christmas break, um, just so we basically had uh, resumes, applications on hand. So removing that barrier of collecting and actually doing the paperwork for the award, um, trying to remove that barrier. And even though we nominated the, the highest number of women for AAPG, they're still not receiving those awards. So we are doing our part. It is now up to AAPG to do their part and to actually go through a cultural transformation in order to ensure that women and other genders are um, receiving the awards that they deserve to receive. There's also a mentoring program that Saudi Aramco and Gretchen has funded. Um, so we've used this as also a catalyst to provide the emotional support for women to achieve uh, these positions and these awards going forward. And then I think one thing that's also really, really important and is something that I know I work on with my husband is the inclusion of men. So it's really important to embrace them because sometimes they actually can feel uh, attacked and not really understand what their role is and how they can help. So I think it's really important to have those hard conversations with the men of AAPG and get them on board and make them a part of this process. So AAPG Women's Networks to date, um, we did create a consortium proposal and to date, it has generated over 40,000 funds. And um, the result of that and what, how we've spent that money is a successful online mentoring program. The, um, this is something that the Simulating Diversity did. They implemented the JEDI program, which was given by the specialist that has the info for. Um, just yesterday, Stephanie Nuoko coordinated Picture Scientists luncheon. Um, we also had a sponsorship of a special speaker for the technical session that took place on Monday, the resilience session. I encourage you to check that out and talk to Chair Tara George if you have questions about that. And then um, we are also looking um, to use any funding going forward for research efforts and publication costs to produce this publication. Um, and then, yeah, I had already mentioned that we have created an online database for resumes and previous awards. So we can quickly and easily nominate uh, women. So if you have any material that you would like to see added to that database from your organization, uh, please feel free to send me an email or get a hold of me or anyone in the Women's Network and we'll add any of that material to our database to ensure that women are nominated for awards. And I guess I will leave uh, this last quote with you. This is my mantra and something in, that I constantly say to myself, especially in those difficult moments, is you just simply have to live and be the change that you want to see in the world. And this is something that I feel that going forward and to truly uh, break the glass ceiling is something that I try to live by. And I encourage you to do the same. So thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Those graphs were really frustrating and enlightening, actually. <laughs> I know we've, we've talked, we've spoke about them before, but every time we see them, I'm just very annoyed. It's frustrating. It really is frustrating. So I'm going to open it up for questions. I have a few we can start with. Um, unless everybody's really just really wants to jump in, I'll start our start. I will start off with our panelists. If our panelists wouldn't mind turning their cameras on, if you have the bandwidth, if you're if you're in the mood. To be on camera. 
Uh, we have a joint first question for everybody. It's a, uh, it's about the kind of the elephant in the room. What do you see as tangible steps we can take to affect change and related to this, what can professional organizations and societies do to change the climate and culture of geoscience? So, what are, so I know um, awareness is only the first step and we need to act. That was mentioned on one of our presenter, presenter slides. Acting is, is gonna be the next series that we have to address here because we all are aware now of the issues. So I'm gonna hand it over to our panelists if anyone wants to start and I will uh, repeat the question. What do you see as tangible steps we can take to affect change and what can professional organizations and societies do to change the climate and culture of geoscience? I'll take a stab at that one, Chris. Um, this is Meredith. I, I would say that probably the most enlightening thing about what we could be doing is that oftentimes a lot of leadership with at least within AAPG, I can't speak for SEG has said that we are, you know, making strides in the inclusion and diversity space and I'm not like no, 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 we've been talking about doing it, but we haven't actually done anything yet. And um, I don't know how many uh, unfortunately, it wasn't a recorded session, um, but yesterday when we spoke, had the DPA luncheon with uh, Billy Williams, who's the executive vice president of diversity, equity, inclusion, and initiatives related to that for AGU, he was saying that some of the things that they have done at AGU's meetings have been to initiate a protocol in which there are people who have, that are considered safe AGU people so that you can give um, any kind of conflict that you may be having during a meeting to those individuals and they are empowered by training and also monetarily they have given $100 to help people with any issues that they may be having without a meeting. And they still resolve to help people resolve those issues entirely at the meeting and not afterwards and even if just to implement something like that at an APG meeting I think would be great. And I know that uh, Ann Drocker has brought that up a number of times because there's been conventions she's attended in which that's a standing protocol. Um, but we really just need to press impress upon leadership that we need to stop talking about it and just do it. And I think that uh, Billy has presented the case in which there's already a, a companion organization that is doing this and be willing to, to uh, offer their training to us as something that uh, we can implement in our uh, organization, whatever form that takes in the future. And so I think that that would be a really easy thing is just that we have invested volunteers who are there to be to help and be willing to invest their time to make sure that conference attendees don't encounter some of the issues that we've heard in some of these presentations. Thank you, Meredith. Yeah, doing the actual acting part is gonna be the most difficult thing, I think. Like you said, we talk about it all the time, but what are we actually doing to change it? Why is it hard to increase diversity in STEM, specifically geoscience fields, not the, not the medical fields? We have a ton of women in the medical field. It seems that that was the first branch of STEM to actually expand into the um and, and like bring more females in and it started with nursing obviously and now there's like so many female medical doctors and then it seems like uh engineering and the power sector came after that and now we're still behind so why is it why do you think it's so difficult to increase um female and diversity in in geoscience are girls uh and minorities opposed to being outside it's like that they don't like camping what are your thoughts I think I'm going to try there. Um, I, I don't think, um, I think it's an intersection of, of, of things that, that also had to do in how we're raised um, because of the paradigms of what uh, boys do versus what girls do. And, and of course, if you're not exposed to certain uh, activities from early on, you don't, you're not aware of them and you don't know that you like them. So, so that's one component of it. Uh, but also, I mean, someone was showing, um, some data uh, saying how uh, women geoscience tend to drop off from the job market at mid-career levels, which I, I, I mean, I have been aware of that uh, for a number of, of, of years and I, and I wonder, well, why, you know? And now that I'm in a mid-career position, uh, you know, navigating uh, 
life, you know, you can clearly see how certain situations can push you into a corner where you, you drop, not because you want to, but because, you know, things go the wrong direction at the wrong time. And, and the problem there is there is no way to go back in, you know, um, and, and this uh, it's not only childcare, uh, it, it's all kind of things that have to do with, with family, uh, with health. Um, and then I think mobility is also an issue for women, you know, because in our profession, at least the way I have experienced it, I mean, there was a period of time where I was in a plane every, every, every week. And the, the reality of things is that the, the, um, the weight of, uh, of what you need to do uh, to take care of your family in today's society, I wouldn't say 100% of it, but a big percentage of it still falls into women's shoulders, right? Um, so how to address that? Uh, it's, it's most important to me uh, because we know that the problem is there. And I think it connects with the previous question. And I think, you know, I'm very pragmatic. I, I think we need more women in leadership positions and we need these women to act on the power that they have to help uh, people under their supervision. And in there, there is a, I think there is a dark room that we don't talk too much about because unfortunately I have also seen that there's a lot of horizontal hostility um, in, in, in these situations where sometimes you are trying to make your, <clears throat> your way through the ranks and, and you're behaving <laughs> a little bit as a, as a man in, in certain aspects when you get there, you know, and you do this miss uh, the, the realities of, of women under your supervision. So I, I think that's a conversation and an internal thing that we also need to explore more and I wish we could talk more about it. Those are my two cents. There you go. <laughs> I would like to um, add a point off of Lorena's comment about um, how women maybe act towards each other when they're you know, fighting for a similar role. Um, I've given this a lot of thought. Uh, right now I'm located in Montana and for all intensive purposes, I'm working up in a man camp and I've been paying really close attention to um, male behaviors. And one thing I've noticed, you know, the last, I've been up here since June, um, even if they don't really like each other, they help each other and they, um, it's just very different than women, the man-to-man -man interaction in this sort of environment. And even if they screw up or make a mistake, they kind of give each other a hard time, but there's never, they never kind of seek out and try to, you know, get someone fired or anything like that. They're very forgiving towards each other. And I think that that's something that, even though it's been difficult being in this work environment, that I think that we could even try to embrace a little bit, bit more, not act like a man, but we need to embrace each other more and work to help each other and forgive each other. If we think that someone made a mistake or miscommunication, whatever it may be, I just, they, they get over it really quickly. They're, they don't hold this like hostility towards each other that maybe sometimes uh, women can do. So yeah. I'm sure I'll have more um, later. That's really all that I wanted to say on that. But I, I'll, I'm sure there'll be more learnings from the man camp up in Montana that I'll be able to share in the future. All right, there's some questions in the chat too. There's actually really good, <laughs> don't be catty. There's a lot of uh, comments though. So, um, how do we how do we deal specifically with the relationships like you just mentioned? Um, I think they're I don't think they're intentional um, Manu Manu Bia. I think that just having things in common give you a stronger basis for a relationship. And when you already have a, a relationship with someone, it makes it easier to to work with them. Um, we used to always have like crew engagements before we would drill a well and it made it a lot easier to work with the team because you got to meet everybody in advance of the operation. I think it's really important to kind of 
to actually build that like human relationship with with people that you're working with because we're not robots i mean we we do have relationships with people that we work with and if you're drilling well and you have to call somebody at two in the morning it's a lot easier if you already have like a, a pleasant relationship with them or you know a, something that you you actually have common ground on so how do we deal with this specific point it's really tough and like Lorena mentioned, if we did have more women in leadership and in mid-career positions, we would have more of a situation where we see the same thing between women and we would have people getting along in a, in a similar situation. And it's, it's just that we observe these behaviors with men because they're just like, they just dominate the workplace. We just observe it because there's so many, so many more of them around us all the time. <laughs> Um, so what are some things we can do to get um, a broader swath of men engaged in our organizations? Like I drag my husband into all these events that we promote. And I, I think a lot of us do that. We drag our, our partners in and it's, it's important that we, we build the, the ally network, but it's, it's tough because the people that we really need as allies are not the ones that are in these phone calls. They're not in these sessions. You know what I mean? We need to figure out how we can get a, a, a larger reach and, and get more people involved. So men tend not to trust women and trust men, even though they know their mistakes. And I might have to clarify that, that statement a little bit, but I guess, yeah, there's a, there's a general mistrust, I guess. It just depends how well you know the person. If you build that personal relationship with somebody or if you've already completed a project together, that's how you build trust, you know? <laughs> We're very interested in main camp learning. Um, okay, great insight. So there's a follow-up question I'm put in. So based on a Harvard study, as many as half the women in STEM roles are leaving mid-career. So how are we going to set an example for the next generation of women, Lorena, to pursue STEM? Uh, children, whether they're minorities or not, emulate what they see and role models in this department are key. So related to the previous question, what can we do to keep women in STEM roles? So a lot of... Uh, directly pandemic related issues over the past two years. Dominantly, women had to leave the workplace because of childcare or just other general issues related to COVID. So how are we gonna keep women in STEM roles when it seems like an uphill battle the whole time? I think Lara has her uh, hand raised, huh? Hola, can you hear me? Uh, well, I have a lot to say, actually, um, but uh, I'll keep it short. Um, you have been talking about diversity, inclusion, uh, how do we get more women in geoscience? And all I can think about is um, that sense of belonging. And for me, that's something that is super key. Uh, being uh, Venezuelan, I'm working in uh, or studying in the United States and in the UK. Um, I found uh, really, really hard to feel that I belong. Um, I feel sometimes that I'm speaking to the void, and I, think, I see that a lot, even here in this panel, like we're here, but we are the ones that who care, who care and who are actually creating groups to make change. But we are the people that we want to teach, we want to bring into this um, initiative. Are they here, maybe a couple? Uh, so um, I strongly believe in more visibility and also uh, showing the younger generations um, and, and children, you know, uh, what they can become. So role models are important as well. And that is one of the reasons we prepare these, you know, Geo Latinas. Uh, instead of focusing on more theory, I like to show, you know, more real things that um, where people can feel um, inspired and can identify and, and, and feel that it can, they can become, um, you know, a, a successful uh, person in, in geoscience. So I know there's a lot there, actually have to leave early, but um, all I wanna say is like, let's collaborate, but really collaborate. Um, because sometimes I feel like, uh, yeah, Geo Latinas is, is the only thing that I can do because that's the only time I gave up with anything else, I gave up with APG, I gave up with SCG, I gave up with belonging to any other uh, community because I don't feel like I can actually be seen and heard. So that's why I created Yo Latinas in the first place because I know that here 
I have I find people who can connect with me and people who can actually listen to me understand my language. And I'm not talking about English or Spanish, but they can understand my challenges. And um, so, but I'm, I'm here and I am grateful with Rochelle because Rochelle can see, I think she can see many of us, not only, you know, where she is, but she can see Black and Science and she can see Geo Latinas so and she's there to support. And that's, that's the only reason that I'm here. Otherwise, you know, it's difficult for me to belong anywhere else. Um, so I just wanted to say that, um, you know, if you can give me five minutes of your time and I can tell you about my story. So I'm very grateful that you actually listened to me today. And uh, thank you so much. And thank you for inviting me. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Clara. All right, any other any other questions? Does anybody want to go back to any of the other discussion points? Like how do we how do we promote STEM in the younger generation? And then once we get women into STEM, how do we keep them mid-career? I've just continuously seen people leave the the company that I work at. It's just really, it's really frustrating. I think another comment that I had, you know, was <clears throat> when, when you reflect on these things, um, you know, women tend to be a whole lot harsher on ourselves. <laughs> uh, and uh, a lot of dropping off or just leaving positions or not taking uh, positions. You know, I, 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 in, in many occasions I have been, I have been in situations where a leadership position has been offered to someone. And, and if a man would definitely say, yes, excellent. When do I start? You know, what's next? And then women tend to question their own capabilities or uh, doubt that they have the, 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 the skills or, or, or the tools to, to embrace those uh, positions. So, and in general, you know, even without a leadership position or role, we, we are too harsh on, on ourselves. So, so maybe that's another element that needs to be discussed in terms of saying, hey, you don't need to you don't need to have all your stuff together all the time. Uh, it's okay to, to drop the ball from time to time. It's okay to fail from time to time. Um, you don't need to know it all, all the time. And that doesn't mean that you cannot take that position. And I go, I, I, I mentioned that because I go back about uh, specific uh, actions and how to improve this. And I honestly believe that we're not going to be able to move forward until enough people get into leadership positions where they can actually, male or female, you know, where they, they can actually make a difference um, out, of, out of power, good power, you know, uh, saying to your employee, if you need that flexibility to take care of your child, it's okay, you can do it. You know, if, if you need that flexibility to work from home, okay, it's okay, you can, you can do it. Um, and, and, and to reinforce that not everything is just performance uh, and that you're not going to be measured as a machine, that you're also a human being and you don't have to be perfect all the time. Yeah, perfect would be boring. Um, I, might, I might mention just a couple of thoughts to kind of related to, you know, what we can do and also maybe kind of related to that question of how do we get men involved and engaged in these conversations too. And I'm coming at this from, from the academic pers perspective, coming from university and teaching students. But one um, piece of information kind of uh, if something that I've learned over the past year is um, kind of putting into the context, what's the history of why we do things the way we do and how are they influenced by um, kind of the white male population that started doing something initially. And so, um, one resource that I found was the geocontext, and I'll put that in the chat in just a minute, but it's kind of a list of resources, and I think that the plan is that this continues to grow, but kind of putting things into context of what's the historical, um, kind of what, what's the historical reason, or what's the history behind some of the practices in the fields of geology and, and what, um, how they started. Um, and then the other thing that I might kind of mention too is, is you know, we've got all these inform this information, and how do we kind of put this out there kind of more broadly too? And, um, you know, all of the organizations here, like I mentioned, like the Geo Ascend project, like there's so much of this, these data available and kind of compiling all of that so that in conferences, in meetings that 
we've all started this conversation or we've all started this conversation and we can kind of keep this going um, and kind of contribute to that, that coordination network or research coordination network to try to make sure that we can think about what is the culture and what do we want that culture to be in the future and making sure that we present that. So what are some ways you guys think we can, we can really expand our effort to get more people involved in broadening the awareness of what's going on? I know every time we show the graphs and the, the underlying statistical and quantitative data, it always is very obvious, but like we, we have to kind of brainstorm and think about how we're actually gonna make an impact. So like, how do we act on this? I think that the, one of the first steps to making sure that is to build an awareness that it's not a us problem as in us being women or us being a, a certain group of people who are experiencing the effects of discrimination and bad practices within industry and academia, but it's a we problem. We are unilaterally affected by this issue. And so, you know, even if, you know, men don't necessarily have a broad awareness that this is happening. It still is exist something that exists within their workplace and whether or not they want to believe it or not, it is impacting the general performance of the company or the department that everybody works in and that it's in everybody's best interest to make sure that we strive to have organizations that are cognizant and work proactively working to minimize the effects of these kinds of bad behaviors. Um, but and just making sure that the engagement is there from the very beginning and making sure that they understand that it's not just a problem that we are dealing with, it's that we collectively, men and women and everybody who's involved, uh, need to be equally invested in a better solution. I would like to make a comment about engaging men um, in the groups. Uh, we do have many men who are part of Geolatina, many. Um, so what I've seen is that many groups that are uh, women um, focused, um, they don't accept men and they have private groups. I'm not talking about these groups, but I have seen some of them. Uh, but uh, we strongly believe in your Latinas that uh, the support for men is super key, especially in Latin America and even in, you know, everywhere around the world. So we, um, we, when we ask people to join your Latinas, we say we are inclusive beyond everything beyond origin, beyond religion, beyond gender. And uh, many of the men, we include them in the initiatives and in the Slack channel, they're there participating. We give them, um, for, for example, we have a Geo Latinas from Mexico in like later in three hours. And um, we're gonna have one in Venezuela as well. And the moderators, we have women, but we, hold, we have men as well. They'll be asking us questions uh, and they love it. Uh, I mean, at least we have managed to do that and make, making them feel part of, of the change. And I keep telling them, you know, especially the young guys, the students, your support is super key so that they don't feel like we want to dominate the world and, you know, you're not important because sometimes it feels like that because we have so powerful one. Uh, so I ask them, please, we need your support. And many of the local, of the local teams, uh, in Colombia, everywhere, in Geo Latinas, there are men. Many students are uh, male. So, um, I mean, I'm happy to talk more about it. Um, I have to leave in two minutes, but uh, in Geo Latinas, we have managed to do that. Excellent, thank you. Is there any, any other comments or questions you guys want to address to wrap up the, the panel session? Or any closing comments from any of our panelists now? I would just like to thank uh, Rochelle for, and, and Chris for all their hard work in putting this together. I know that it's, a, it's a, sometimes a challenge to organize uh, as many people and as many excellent presenters as we had during the session. And so I just want to commend everybody who presented today and uh, we're willing to stick it out through our various AB issues. That was the biggest Thank challenge. you Meredith for the Zoom. <laughs> yes, that was the 
that was the saving grace. I don't think we would have got through any of this on the other platform. Yeah, I was crawling out no. of my skin. So thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. All right, awareness is the first step. We have we are all very aware, as noted by our presence here in this meeting. We need to spread our awareness and take action. And maybe some uh, closing actions for the year for 4Q is what we're going to do next year to have a greater impact, to spread the word, to bring more men in as allies. I think it's it's mostly uh, you know ground efforts on our part for now. So. If there's more discussions to be had, let's do it. Let's let's hopefully we can we can continue to network and, and progress this forward. Thank you, Rochelle, for coordinating, arranging all the speakers, organizing the schedule. Any closing comments from Rochelle? Just uh, thank you all for being here. I really appreciate your time. And um, I know that hopefully someday we can all do this and we'll all get paid to do it. So that was really the last piece of this is <laughs> hopefully going forward, we keep doing this and we'll just grow together. <laughs> All right. I hope you guys enjoy the rest of the conference and good luck with your future future sessions. I hope they go uh, better than <laughs> better than this one started out. <laughs>